You can be seated. Thanks for coming to church. My name is Rick. I want to, hey, see you guys. Okay, there you go. There you go. Uh, whenever I see junior hires and high schoolers walk out with our youth intern, I get just a little bit nervous. I mean, you know, not that Joey's not a good guy, but he's only, you know, he's only 12. And so, you know, I'm just only kidding. Yeah, yeah. Brandon, you better get in there quick, man. Where's John L today, anyway? Okay, whatever. I, you know, it's, whatever, you, you know. Anyway, so thanks for coming to church. We, we, we hope that you've been... Had a great time. We, uh, we've been talking now for a while about the empty chair. And it's important <clears throat> that we be about the empty chair because God is interested in the empty chair. Paul writes these words in Romans. He says this, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And isn't that a great truth? That if you call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, He will come into your heart and He will save you. You'll be able now to go from death into life. You were lost, now you're fine. You were blind, now you're able to see. And you get to spend eternity in, with Him. And it's done, wait, it doesn't start in heaven, it starts today. Isn't that good news? Man, that's good news. Anyway, sorry. But, you know, oh, my sermon's short, so I'll be like, this will be long. Anyways, here we go. But how can they call on Him just to save them unless they believe in Him? And how can they believe in Him if they have never heard about him. There are hundreds, if not thousands of people in our county who don't even know that they need him. They're so lost, they don't even know that they need to be found. And it's our job to be about sharing this good news that has blessed our lives. Because we're blessed, right? I mean, we're blessed. I mean, come on now. Really? I mean, we are blessed. We're blessed by family. We're blessed by church family. We're blessed by God's blessing on our lives. I mean, I I know I am. Last week, our daughter-in-law posted a video of our 16-month-old dancing and worshiping God. I'm done. But see, it's, and so I've got mine. I win. But see, that's not what God says here. He says, those of you who know what you know and have been blessed by the Lord God Almighty, now it's our job and to go tell the world that, of the things that they don't even know that they're missing. That's, that, that's our imperative. And it goes on there in chapter 10 of Romans. It says this, that is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. Don't you want to be one of those beautiful people who bring good news? I mean, think back in your life to the people that introduced you to faith in Christ. Think back to that. It might have been your dad. I know for my wife it was her mom. Her dad, some, but her mom. For me, it was my sister's best friend, Carrie Bambauer, who invited my sister to church, and she started going, and then there was still room in the Bambauer station wagon for me to come to church. And so they would pick up me and my sister every week, and they would take us to church. And then I... Uh, Got to, I, I grew up, and that was, I started going to church when I was like in sixth grade, and then I grew up and, and never gave my life to Christ. But yet, then one year came this guy, his name was Dave Toman, he was a youth pastor. And I just want to let you know, he's a, he's, he's a very, he's a, he's a godly man and a great pastor, but he was the world's wor- worst youth pastor. I mean, ever, in the history of the world. He, I mean, no, I'm serious. We were part of, of a big church, and so he was just, he was just over the, uh, the, the junior high and high school because it would, you know, so, but we had a big church, and we would go and do uh, what was back then called deputation. We would go and minister to small churches. We would take a little choir, and I couldn't sing. Well, I mean, I can sing. I just can't sing good, and so, or well, and so, but I can speak. I can talk, 
And so I would come along, and they would put, put me on the outskirts of the little, you know, there would be like an 11-person choir, and they would like, you know what, Rick? Um, we appreciate it if you would sing, you know, soft, but occasionally just mouth the words. That would be best. And then we would sing, and I would give a little testimony, and, and it was fun. We would go all over the place. And twice during these trips, we would stop for, you know, get a, to get a Gatorade or, you know, back then, you know, it was just, it was just soda. Just, it was, back then it was just soda and candy. You know, we didn't have, you know, low-calorie Gatorade. It was just, it was the good stuff, soda and candy. And we stopped, and twice on these trips, he left kids behind. I swear to you, we're like driving down, and hey, anybody see Nate Welty? No. Oh, oops. He's at the service station. He was horrible. I mean, but, but God used him to speak into my life. And God used him to, to you know, give me an opportunity to, to give my life over to Christ. And Dave Tolman and Carrie Baumbauer, man, when I think about them, they are beautiful. And people in our county need to see you as beautiful. We need to be about bringing that good news to the people of our county. But that's not what we're talking about today. That was just extra. What we're talking about today is money. Now, I know, we start talking about money in the church. We all get kind of get nervous, and we all get, we start to, you know, get all a little excited. But we're not talking about God's money. We're not talking about that we want more money. In fact, you guys are so you guys are so generous. Last year, you folks and the other ones that you, you know, come to the other services gave $813,000 to the work of God's kingdom. That's amazing. Let that see. $813,000 between just our little, our little congregation here in Northeastern California. That's to the general fund and the building fund. Not to mention, you gave money to uh, fund the, the summer lunch program, and we fed, you know, thousands of, of lunches. Not to mention the, you know, $4,800 you gave to help k- get kids to summer camp. Or the $6,000 plus you gave to, to go to the Syrian refugees. Or the $5,000 plus that you gave to go to uh, our missionary in South Africa, uh, What's his name? Jit. Jit and Mignon Dubenhag. That's it's it's not English, is it? No. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying. Not, not, not to mention the money that you gave so that, so that we could give uh, holiday food boxes to 22 families. You guys are amazing. So we're not, we're not saying give more. We're just saying that, you know what, that we believe that biblical stewardship is something that we have to teach. And the reason is, is that because God talks about it. There, in fact, there's 800 verses about money in Scripture. Jesus talks about money more than hell or heaven or salvation. The only thing he talks uh, about more than money, Jesus, is about loving one another, about relationships. And so we want to talk about money because we think that, that there can be a new kind of normal when you, when you deal with your finances under God's plan. And so we're going to be talking about for these next five weeks, uh, five weeks in sermons and nine weeks of Financial Peace University, and we'll be talking about that more. We'll be talking about this, that we believe that money management is a spiritual issue. Now, some people might think that, you know, we should never talk about money in church and that every time the the pastor, uh, you know, stands up to talk about money, he just wants more money. But really, we believe, and we believe the Bible teaches it very clearly, that money is about a freedom issue. It's about, are you enslaved to that, or are you free from it? Do you have power and victory over it? See, because we believe that if the Bible says in 800 times it talks about money, that we should preach the entire Bible. Not just what makes you feel good, not just what encourages you. And we want, and we hope you come to church and you're encouraged and you feel good when you leave it. But we want to talk about the whole of Scripture. So we want you to get, oh, we're going to open our, our Bible, we're going to lay our checkbook right alongside of it, and we're going to see over these next five weeks in the sermons, the next nine weeks in financial peace, what God says about how to better handle money. This morning, we're going to look at three biblical 
principles about your money. So before we do that, before we open God's Word, let's pray. Father, thank you that you are here this morning, that worship has been great. And as we sung at the top of our lungs, proclaiming, Lord, that you are God and we are your children, we have encountered you. And Lord, we would ask that you would continue to lead us and guide us as we encounter you this morning more. Father, may you prepare our hearts now to receive from your word what you say about biblical stewardship. Lord God, give us ears to hear and hearts to, to learn so we might take steps that will, would bring about transformation in our lives. God, I would pray for every other church in this valley that as, as leaders and pastors and elders step into pulpits and they open up God's word, that every church where the name of Jesus is proclaimed and glorified as Lord, that you would have your way with that church this morning. Lord, from uh, Honey Lake Assembly to, to, uh, to Westwood, Calvary Chapel, to, to uh, the Nazarene Church, just right across the road there by the hospital, Lord, to Susanville Christian Fellowship on Hall Street. God, thank you that, that they are our brothers and sisters, all of them, and that the, together you have called us to be about sharing the good news with this broken and hurting place called Lassen County. So, Father, we look forward to what you have for us now. We would ask that you would speak to our hearts as we look at your word. In your name I pray. Amen. So if you need a Bible, raise your hand. We got, guy, well, we got one guy back there. Everybody else has gone home. So Jim, yeah, oh, there you go. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Say hi to Joe. This is Joe's first, first week as a greeter. He did a nice job, and so we're happy, him and, him and his wife. Yeah, yeah, give Joe a hand. I mean, he just, he just stood there and, and handed out bulletins. I mean, it's not that hard, but I mean, but give Joe a hand. <laughs> just, just he, he, hey, here at Community Church, you got to want it, you know. Anyway, biblical principle number one is this. Money is a powerful force. We need to recognize the power that money has in our lives. We, we want to give it too much credit, but we want to we make sure that we realize that, that, it, that it has some power over us. But as we look at it, we, we, look, we realize that there's two major distortions about how people see money. The first one is this, that money is a sign of God's blessing. And that's just wrong. Turn with me to Matthew 19, verses 23 and 24. Matthew 19, verses 23 and 24. And Jesus says this, he says this, I tell, Jesus said, said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it's very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. The idea that, it's e that money is a sign of God's blessing is just a falsehood. It's absolutely 100% wrong. In the Proverbs, we, we see this. Proverbs 28, 6 says, Better a poor man whose walk is blameless than a rich man whose ways are perverse. God prefers you to walk with him, and he doesn't care if you have money or no money. He prefers that you walk with him versus walking away from him. So money is not a sign of God's blessing. That's just wrong. The real issue is, you know, what is the condition of your heart? Is your heart turned towards God or is your heart turned away from God? And those are the only options. You might kid yourself into thinking that there's a, a third way, but, but, and We've been learning in, in, the, in the adult class that, you know, there might be a third way, but if you go to church and you're religious, but yet your heart isn't turned towards God and taking all the credit for yourself, that's really turning your heart away from God. So there's really two options. Either my heart is warm towards God or I'm doing this on my own, whether you're inside or outside of church. So money is not a sign of blessing. It's neutral. In fact, that's the second distortion, that money is evil. That's wrong too. There's nothing evil about money. Scripture does not say the root of all evil is money. It just doesn't say that. We think it says that. It just doesn't say that. We'll look at that verse here in a couple minutes. See, what happens is money really is neutral. It's, it has no feelings. When you pinch money, it doesn't bleed. Same way as a pile of bricks. 
You take a brick and you hold it in your hand and, you, and, and if you cuddle the, that brick, it doesn't say, oh, I love Rick more than Gwen because Rick, spend, Rick spends time with me. A brick doesn't say that. Neither does a $100 bill. They say, oh, man, you know what? I like Gwen better because because Gwen feeds me better. What? It's just money. It's, it's neutral. In fact, it's like bricks. Bricks can do either good or they can do bad. Years ago, we were getting ready to, this church was just steel studs and outside walls and windows. That's all we had. Steel studs, outside walls and windows. We had a foundation Concrete foundation. And uh, some teenagers decided that, you know, that uh, they would use our church to have a poker party. And so they set up back in that corner. They had five-gallon, uh, empty five-gallon drums as, uh, as chairs. They had a sawhorse and plywood as a table. And they played cards. So we, we found cards and poker chips. They they drank beer. And at some point, because there was empty beers, and at some point they thought, you know what? This is boring. This is, I mean, this has been fun for a while, but let's do something more fun. So they took bricks and rebar, and they broke 52 windows of this church. I mean, it happened, you know, five years ago, so it's like ancient history now. But see, they chose to take this, this amoral thing, a brick, and use it for destruction. You can do that with money. Money is not inherently evil. It depends how you use it. Or you can use bricks to build a place where God is glorified and worshipped. So money is just like bricks. What, what money does do, though, is this. Money really is a magnifier, isn't it? If you're a jerk and you have money, guess what? You're just a bigger jerk. Right? Anybody know that person? Yeah, see, people are shaking their heads. But if you're a godly, giving steward and you have more resources, guess what happens? Then you become just that with money and you're able to bless people more. Money is not good or evil. Money is amoral. But it does magnify. 1 Timothy 6.10 says this, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. You catch that? The love of money. Not money, but the love of money. And some people, craving money, have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. The second principle is this. Money expands and limits our options. Money expands and limits our options. Proverbs 22, 7 says this, Just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. Whenever there's a, a, a master-slave relationship, the master is the one that calls the shots. The slave then does what the master says that they must do. And if your Visa card or your MasterCard or your student loan or your car payment is your master, then you are slave to that master. So this really is about this intense spiritual relationship. Managing your money is about an intense spiritual relationship. Dave Ramsey, who's the author of Momentum and the author of this series and the author of Financial Peace University, he says this about this, when all, about money. When all of our money has someone else's name on it, we are simply not as nimble, not as able to respond to the opportunity God sends our way. I love trucks. I don't have a truck, but I love trucks. I wish I had a truck, but I can't afford a truck. So I get, occasionally, I'm really excited when I get to drive other people's trucks. If you want me to, to house sit your truck for you, I'm that guy. If you're going on vacation, you need someone to take your truck around, make sure you know, it doesn't get clogged up with, with bad gas or old gas or gunky gas, I'm your guy. Two years ago, we, I was on the mission trip to Grants Pass. 
And uh, it was rainy and snowy and nasty. And so uh, it was time to go get coffee. And I don't know if you know this, but this is a little tidbit. This will help you if you're ever in a bar doing bar trivia. I don't know if you ever do that. Anybody ever do, play bar trivia? No, no one's going to raise their hand now. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Anyway, but Grants Pass is the home. It's where um, Dutch Brothers Coffee originated from. It's the home of Dutch Brothers Coffee. Yeah, I know. See, ooh, ooh. Some, some of you who are, young, who, who are younger than 40 know what Dutch Brothers Coffee is. Other people say, I don't even like Starbucks. But anyway, so anyway, so it was my turn to go get coffee, and I didn't have a car or a truck. I didn't drive up there. I went with somebody else. And so I took this guy's truck. And this guy's truck, who will r- remain nameless, cost $51,000. Woo! And man, it was amazing! I mean, I got in that thing. I mean, I opened the door, and I forgot to tell us in the first two services, but it's like this little, this little thing came out, man. So it was like, I didn't have to step up. I just got to step in. Like, it was like walking the stairs into the truck. And I sat down, and, I, and, and this strange sensation happened. My bottom was warm. It was like, woo! What are those called? Seat warmers, that's right. My seat was warm. It was beautiful. And I'm, like, I'm driving down, and I'm like all raised up and like looking at people walking down Main Street. Man, I just wanted to do this, you know, but I didn't. <laughs> but I didn't. And so, so I go get the coffee, and I get it all put away. And, you know, there's like cup holes, everything. I, I think I bought like 40. No, I, I, I'm not, now I'm going to lie. But anyway, so I get the coffee, and I put it in there, and I start to back up. It had one of those rear view mirror backup cameras, whatever they're called. And I wasn't paying attention because I was too excited about the console, which looked like a spaceship. I'd never been in a spaceship. I'm just imagining that's what it looked like. And I'm backing up, and all of a sudden I hear this beep, beep, beep. And it's like, oh, my goodness, I almost ran into a pole. This truck stopped me from having a minor traffic violation. It's incredible. Now, I'm not saying that God wants you to sell your $51,000 truck. (laughs) I'm not saying to you, maybe to Pastor Steve, no. But what I am saying is this. If that's your master, God might want you to get rid of it so that you're more nimble. There's a young family in our church who decided to do just that. They owed his in-laws some money, and they had some debt, and he had a nice truck, $25,000, $30,000 truck. Not the $51,000, but still, you know, it's a nice truck. And they decided that it was important for them to sell the truck so they could get out of debt completely, and then they ended up buying a $12,000 truck. So now they're nimble. And when he went on the woodcutting day, and he put that, that cut down tree in the back of his bed, that, that wood didn't say, oh man, I'm only in a $12,000 truck. It still does what it does. I'm not saying that it's time for you to go sell your truck. I'm just saying, are you nimble? So that one God says, hey, I want you to do this for my kingdom. You can Versus saying, hey, you know what? I really want to help out that single mom. Because someone helped me when I was a single mom. But, man, I just had to have that pair of shoes and that new outfit. And so my visa payment is way too much this month, so I can't do that. Or, you know what? I really want to give to help the refugees in Syria. I really want to help that that church in in Antica, I really do. But yeah, I don't have any margin in my budget because of my spending for over the last year, and so I just can't. God wants you to be nimble. He doesn't want you to be enslaved to your credit cards or your shoes or your car payments. He wants you to be able to respond when he speaks to you in a still small voice. The Bible has much to say about 
biblical stewardship, and so we're going to just look at that right now. See, because first, because the third principle is that money must be managed, and, 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 and manage just means stewardship. Stewardship means literally means manager. So when we talk about biblical stewardship, we're talking about properly managing God's resources. We're not talking about, you know, giving more or, you know, let's take an extra offering. We're talking about that God's resources and all that we have is God's resources. See, go to the front of the book of Scripture and you'll see there in Genesis 1, Genesis 1, that everything, everything was made by God. Everything. Even your intellect that allowed us to now have, you know, this thing and a computer that has a phone app. That's, it's not an iPhone 6 anymore. It's an iComputer 6 that has a, a phone app, Right? God has, done, God has done all of this in our lives. All of it. Every single thing we have comes from the Almighty. So when we're talking about properly managing God's resources, we're talking about properly managing everything that we have. All our resources and all our relationships. Proverbs 27, 23 says this, Know the state of your flocks and put your heart into caring for your herds. See, God requires that we manage what we have. God requires that we manage what we have. What you have, how you, much you have it, and what you're doing with it, God requires that you ask those, yourself those questions. What do I have? How did I get it? And what does God want me to do with it? That's stewardship. Jesus says this in Luke, don't begin until you count the cost, for who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there is a person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Sometimes you have to decide that, you know what, I want this, but I can't have it. It happened here in our church. Back in 2011, when we were deciding that we were going to finish the church, we had been paying for it as we went, and we decided, you know, it's time for us to get a loan and finish it. And we got bids. We got one to finish the building, and we got one bid for the audiovisual and lights stuff. And we, had, we, know, we, we know we had about $1.8 million. Cause that's what we qualified for uh, as a loan. We know we had that. It cost... $1.825 million, and so we got bids. And the first bid for the AV system came in at $750,000. Yeah, Seven, I mean, I mean $750,000. It would have been symphony quality sound system. We just don't need that here. Because if we had decided to have that sound system, we wouldn't have been able to have Carpet or chairs or bathrooms or HVAC. So people would have laughed at us. Oh, look at that church, man. They got to sit on a hard concrete floor, but they got an ama amazing sound system. The principle here is this. Money management requires a plan. And that means occasionally I have to say no to some things and say yes to others. We have a nice sound system. It costs like $113,000. It's a far cry from $750,000. But it does the job for us. It's great. It's amazing. Proverbs 21.20 says, the, the wise have wealth and luxury, but the fool spends whatever they get. I know, this is, this is a hard one because you're going you're gonna to go home and say, Pastor Floyd said this, and I just want to make sure you know it was God, God said this about you, not me. Wise people save money. So by definition, right, by definition, using a little bit of my geometry, if, by, if wise people spend money, then people who, do, who, who, uh, who don't save money are what? 
say it? Okay, so if wise people, if wise people save money, then people who, because there's only three types of people in the Bible, wise, fools, and evil, and we're not, we don't think these people are evil, necessarily, but if wise people save money, then people who spend all they have from, are what? Right, so if you don't save money, you're a fool. I didn't say that. Don't write cards and letters. God said that. And then, fourthly, is this. Building wealth takes time and discipline. Proverbs 28, 20 says this. The trustworthy person will get a rich reward, but a person who wants quick riches will get into trouble. I've been around for about eight years now, and people know me, and they know my story, and they know what's important to me. And a lot of you know that... my favorite book outside of the Bible is a book by Eugene Peterson. It's on the Psalms of Ascent. And it's called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. I just think that's a godly principle that applies to so many areas of our lives. And it, it definitely applies to, to money. You can't expect that to give $500 from your retirement for three years and retire a millionaire. It just takes longer than that. Building wealth and discipline takes time. It takes a, this long, arduous obedience in the same direction, saying no way more than you get to say yes. But that's the truth for anything. That's how you get through addiction. We got several guys in our church that have been cleaning us over for 20 years, and that's, that's hundreds and thousands and perhaps millions of decisions when you just say no, and you say yes to God, and no to the drink, no to the, to the friends, no to the circumstances. Anything worthwhile doing means that you're going to do it for a long time. It's a long obedience, and it's in the same direction. And it's hard. But yet God will bless you as you are disciplined. So the plan, how we make this happen, is using this tool, this amazing tool, called Financial Peace University. And those of us who've been through it have been transformed. I mean, talk to the leadership. Talk to, you know, the staff. It's made a huge difference in people's lives. And that's what we believe is the best way to help you get hold of this principle called biblical stewardship, as well as preaching on it for the next five weeks. The Wall Street Journal tells us this sobering statistic, that seven out of ten Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. And so if we want to put a name on that, we would call those folks foolish. Financial Peace University will help you to become wise in how you deal, deal with God's resources and your finances. George Gallup has found this, that only 32% of America, only 3 out of 10, the other folks that have, don't live paycheck to paycheck, could cover a $5,000 emergency without borrowing money. We want to help you get to a place where you are not enslaved to your lack of resources, but where you can, through God's word and through long obedience, find your way clear of that. So we hope that you'll join us. We have, we have a class that starts tonight at 6 o'clock, and it's taught by Pastor Steve and Cheryl. We've got a class that starts this Tuesday at 6.30, and it's taught by Pastor Rick and Dana. We have a class that starts on Saturday, February 6th at 6 o'clock, and it's taught by myself and Gwen. So come to one of these classes. If you haven't signed up yet, it's not too late. Come to one of these classes. It's $93. It's a lot of money, but yet it will be, it's a great investment. And if you can't afford the $93, man, we will scholarship you for all or part of it, whatever you need. We want you to be at this. Because at this, you will learn these seven things, I believe, with all my heart. You'll learn first how to manage your money. Dave has this 
he teaches this principle that as you do a budget, all, all the budget is is spending your money first on paper before you spend it then in person. So you're taking control of every single dollar. And for those of you, of you who are like me, who are, you know, Excel spreadsheet geeks, I love this, man. I get my paycheck and I, I divide it up in our, our categories. And, and I, we, Gwen talks about it and she says, no, we need more money for that, you know, because we got a dog. So we need more money in the buster fund. It just drives me crazy. You know, she's, he's a dog, you know. He, he, he's hyper out. Gen- uh, never mind. Anyway, so, so, you know, and we put X number of money here and X number of money there. And, we, it, it, and every month it just balances. It's awesome. And we spend our money on paper be- before we spend it in person. It also will teach you how to communicate with your spouse. Communicating with your spouse is important, folks. And now this will get you in a a place where one of the most important areas of your life, you now are having conversations because he forces you, Mr. Ramsey forces you, Financial Peace University forces you, us will force you to have weekly, um, what's it called? Budget meetings. Weekly family budget meetings. And so you got to talk now with your spouse. Number three, it will help you get out of debt. The national stats from pe- folks who do Financial Peace University is that there's an $8,000 turnaround in the first 90 days between getting out of debt and having savings. Because see, it also helps you save for emergencies. It teaches you, you how, to, how to put aside money so that, that it's there in case you do have an emergency. An emergency is not the latest driver. Or that pair of pumps I just got to have because it, it, it comes together with my purse and my new outfit. That's not an emergency, but it shows you how to save for emergencies. Helps you plan for college and retirement. It helps you find the right kind of insurance. Ask all these amazing questions. It's a nine-week journey. Only costs $93. We encourage you to be a part of it. But most importantly, this. It will help set up your family Forever. Not that I don't depend on God more than I depend on my finances, but man, you know what? On this side of heaven, God has called us, Gwen and I, you, to manage the resources he has given us. It's called biblical stewardship. And so we need to be better at that so that we're not enslaved to those things. We have power and victory and dominion just as God set up for us in the garden. And so we believe that if you do this and follow these principles— that it, it can be, it can help you change your family tree. So, join us. Sunday, Tuesday, or on Saturday. Just come. Go back to the lobby. Oh, yeah, by the way, Randy, you got to come now. Sorry. I, I always forget. Go back to the lobby and sign up. Go to the Welcome Center and say, hey, I want to come. Come see Pastor Steve and Rick or myself or one of our wives and come. If you can't afford it, still come. We just believe it's just just that important. Because, see, we believe that that we're going to be on this amazing journey, and we're going to, in the next nine weeks, in the next nine months, in the next 90 days, we're going to hear these amazing stories about people. And we don't want, I mean, with all my heart, I don't want you to be left behind. I don't want you to hear an amazing testimony saying, oh man, I wish I had done that. Because it's right here for you to come and join us. Sunday or Tuesday or Saturday. Father, thank you that you love us and you care for us. And God, I would ask now as we continue in worship that you would uh, speak to our hearts that these folks would make decisions, Lord, to uh, join us, that they would trust you, God, with uh, $93 so that they can see an amazing change in how they handle the resources that you have so blessed them with. So, Father, now as we stand and worship, Lord, may uh, you be glorified in the coming week. In your name I pray. Amen.